Thank you for tuning in to Roll Call. The movie selected is The Wedding Planner. Hey everyone, welcome to Roll Call, the show where two childless millennials gush over movies and follow an actor's journey from their early years through their blockbuster hits. Because let's face it, we miss blockbuster. Hell yeah, and I would for sure plan my wedding motif around that blockbuster aesthetic, baby. What's up, guys? I'm Bria, and I, too, would also prioritize leaving my shoe in the street over being hit by a dumpster. <laughs> and I'm Simone, and I, like Ma Simone, will make you a fancy dinner of Kraft macaroni and cheese and only the finest of Franzia's red wine. So, what's up, bitches? We are now in the new millennium. We are ditching the 90s for the 2000s, but we will always party like it's 1999 or the new millennium, baby. That's so- right. Bust out that, <laughs> bust out that icy blue eyeshadow and dust off some rhinestones because it's about to go down. Yes. The bling era is among us and... Millennium pink is called millennium pink for a reason. Okay, Hell yeah. So make it frosted, baby. <laughs> <laughs> so in today's episode, we'll chat about who else but Jennifer Lopez, aka at this point in time, we finally, I know I struggle with calling her Jennifer Lopez the whole podcast. I just call her J-Lo most of the time. But this is officially the era that we get J-Lo. J mm-hmm. to the Hello. Mm-hmm. So we are chatting about J-Lo, Jennifer Lopez, in the romantic comedy The Wedding Planner, co-starring who else but Matthew McConaughey. All right, all right, all right. <laughs> <laughs> it's a foozy, it's a witchy watchy. It's a... <laughs> <laughs> so let's take a trip back to June 26th. Oh, wait, no, shit, that is not... That, that is January 26th. That's okay. Yes. Try again. <laughs> So let's take a trip back to January 26, 2001 to the wedding planner. So I will get into what was happening the year, the month that it came out, mostly 2001. Let's get into some big fashion moments because who doesn't love early aughts fashion? We know Gen Z does all of a sudden. (laughs) Um, so Bjork wears the swan dress to the uh, upstairs. <laughs> isn't that dress? Isn't that dress in some kind of art music? Like not the MoMA, but like some kind of Smithsonian. The Smithsonian, music. is yeah. it? I I I feel like it should be. It if should it's be. not that in the green dress J Lo wore, I'm just saying. Yep. Just saying. Also, that belongs in the Smithsonian. Justin and Brittany's matching denim outfits. <laughs> oh, iconic. <laughs> iconic. In couple news, we have um, some splits. Tom Cruise and Nicole Kidman finally call it quits in 2001. You, you've seen those iconic pictures of her like walking out from her lawyer's office, right? She looks so happy, right? Yes. Yeah. She's yes. just like arms open. <laughs> oh, man. It's like an allergy pill commercial. Like, yes. <laughs> It's a brand new day. (laughs) Oh my god, I can totally picture. (laughs) Although that song was definitely used for like Vagisil or like (laughs) like genital herpes, not allergies, but it's okay. It's still a good jingle. Yes. So also very relevant. Jennifer Lopez breaks up with Puff Daddy. Oh man. Yes, Sean Puffy Combs and J Lo are no longer a couple. Womp, womp, womp. Um, iconic performances. Britney Spears performed Slave for You at the VMAs with the Boa Python. Uh. Just seared into my little childhood brain. Like, <laughs> like, and I think if you go to wax museums, that's the what they chose. The Britney to be. She, I, mean, I have. Either, it should be that or the, um, I forget the song, but the like nude sparkly suit. 
Oh, that's that's I think when she did Oops I Did It Again. Yeah, whatever it, it should be either of those. those yeah. two looks like chef's kiss. <laughs> like, so good. Whoever. There's definitely like a disposable camera picture of me standing next to that pick that wax statue and i know this is not a visual podcast but my face was extremely awkward and i'm gonna make it for you right now bria it was something like <laughs> <laughs> okay so just just so you know what simone's face evokes to me is like um this is nice but weird but okay take the picture <laughs> why is my mom asking me to stand next to this and take a picture i don't know that's how family trips are just go ahead sweetie go scoot closer (laughs) (laughs) don't be shy (laughs) Uh, we also get the iconic um group i don't ensemble of lady marmalade with christina aguilera pink maya little kim composed by missy elliott like you know what i will say we are in an era of female rappers and missy elliott please do us some service and compose something for all these female rappers and r&b singers to do together because i think we could have another moment yes say. um and other music news i just put this because i care about this survivor the album by destiny's child comes out in 2001 yes the the album of my childhood simone i i'm gonna put you on the spot what were you listening to you think in 2001 literally everything you just said um but i (laughs) i also this is when i started to really get into like alternative grunge punk and like pop punk um, thanks to having wow. a, an older sister who had started to introduce that to me. So in 2001, I was in six on the cusp of seventh grade, um, which is weird because that's the age range of kids that I teach now. But uh, <laughs> I had started to listen heavily to like Newfound Glory, Alkaline Trio, Saves the Day, uh, Blink-182, Green Day, No Doubt. Um, but then like on the other strange and weird side, because I was getting in musical influence by my sister, it was also like corn, slipknot, <laughs> system of a down, my wow. mother, limp biscuit, like <laughs> my poor mother. <laughs> She's like, I just want you to take a picture next to Britney Spears, Simone. Like, why do you have to also be such a shit? Um, <laughs> but I still too, like loved i mean i had the destiny child survivor album i played lady marmalade on repeat moulin rouge was huge like i saw it in the theater um yeah so like any even though i was like still very heavy into like punk and rock music um my like teen i was still going to backstreet boys concerts i went to the destiny's child and christina aguilera like co-lining concert i was I think still i also went to the tro tour around this time yes yes that was my first concert yeah if i haven't already mentioned this in this podcast it will probably come up throughout <laughs> our <run of> this. <laughs> but yes that sounds that sounds amazing i too once I got into middle school, I think that's just like the rite of passage in middle school is to discover alternative, like angsty music. It's just some, it's a chip that gets switched on and you're just like, yes, I wasn't as hardcore as you. I was very surface level, like pop punk, <laughs> but, um, yes, for a black girl that, that is a time that I hold dear to my heart. So in TV news, um, Sex and the City won their first Emmy and is also just like a major thing. I'm also sure that The Sopranos is probably a major thing right now on cable TV. The West Wing was also a big show. Um, Survivor, the TV show, the reality TV show. Um, but t- Survivor, the TV show, wins an Emmy, so major news. And sad, but um, I think very poignant, is Aaliyah passed away in a plane crash, yeah. leaving the set of her Rock the Boat video, which <sighs> I remember where I was. Do you remember where you were when you found out that news? 
If it was on a weekday, we definitely tuned into it because TRL would have been covering it all day. I think it was a weekend and it was in the summer. Oh. So I remember, okay, so I was in Reno with my uncle and his family and he like called us and he was like, hey, you guys, and he was like, Aaliyah died. And I, I called him a liar and, and a black family lets to know no. <laughs> like he did <laughs> not, I was like, or I didn't call him a liar. I was like, you're lying. Like, and he was like, N- like sternly like no I'm not and don't ever like kind of like (laughs) and don't you ever say that and he's like no look watch the so we saw on the news as well they were reporting Mm. that and like I just that's the first time probably since like Selena the movie that I was like so she's just not gonna be here anymore like it's a hard thing to grasp at yeah. that age. Yeah. Especially a celebrity, because it's like they're not in your day to day, but I loved Aaliyah more than I loved Beyonce probably at that time. So like that was just devastating. But and I, I think RMP too. Girl. Uh I know. And just the the nature of how it happened. It's like one of those things that's like it is a freak accident and plane crashes are rare, but when they happen, they're all the more scary. Um yeah. And like we've lost a lot of influential music ar- music artists from from plane crashes, and yeah, it's but, kind of crazy how yeah. that happens frequently. But you're well, not lately, but yeah, right. Well, but I think I think you're right though. Thinking back on it, I it wasn't on TRL, but we probably would have just had MTV on or VH1 on all day, and the VJs would have been covering it. The like different music my journalists. Dude, um, what's his name with MTV News? It's like Kirk, Kurt Loader or yeah. whatever. Yeah. That guy. Yeah. Oh man. When he came on, you knew some shit was popping off. Like, yeah. you're like, uh-oh. Uh-huh. We're not watching music videos <laughs> in the real world. It, it was like beep, 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 beep. <laughs> yes, yes. So um I also shared a list of the top songs from 2001 if you want to peruse and if you see anything that jumps out at you that you're like what yes that is a jam for me alicia keys falling was amazing i had the alicia keys braids when i was in fourth grade all for you by janet jackson iconic and then of course jennifer lopez i'm real with ja rule and I um, can't go. And then just so many independent women, Destiny's Child, um, Shaggy, it wasn't me. Oh my. And even like Let Me Blow Your Mind with yes. Eve and Gwen Stefani. I love that song. Yes. That is like one of the best collaborations of like people from two different worlds and genres yes. that like from yes. our era at least, because of course you have Run DMC, Aerosmith, but mm-hmm. like that. Gwen Stefani and Eve, they were holding it down for the girls. Like, truly, I was like, I want to be on a four wheeler in a bikini top, <laughs> singing, <laughs> singing with my friend Simone. Let's recreate that. I'm so down. <laughs> okay, on a on a totally unrelated note, though. So because that's when that song was released, like that actually got me a little bit more into Eve, and um one so i I hope you didn't perform love is blind no 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 (laughs) no i did not but so eve is has these tattoos she has these infamous tattoos of paw prints like above her curvature of her breasts and there was a um a bar mitzvah that i went to that had (laughs) there was a bar mitzvah that i went to where like some of the entertainment was like a henna tattoo, like airbrush tattoo. And can you imagine me? I had this like hot topic kind of like black and white polka dot pin dress. And that was like my nice bat mitzvah dress. And I wore like a little cardigan that had cherries on it because again, like I was getting really into like the rockabilly punk scene. And then I go, I go up to funny. A full grown, yeah, yes. And I go up to a full grown man and I'm like, can you give me a- things and he (laughs) was so professional and such a pro but i wonder sometimes if that man thinks back at that experience and was like i painted bear bear paws on a 12 year old (laughs) 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 and didn't tell you no he didn't tell me no but he did him like 
way up high. Like I wasn't like, here you go, daddy. I was just like, yeah, because you know the the dress was like a sweetheart line, so it was like a oh bit of a. God. <laughs> I don't think I my swear parents... sometimes oh, my your off. life. You should write a sitcom. <laughs> Like what? I know. Oh my gosh, I know. that is amazing. Oh I thought I was so cool. It lasted for a long time. Uh, yes. All right. Well, also looking at this list, at this time I wasn't listening to these songs, but I have a great appreciation for them now. After I enjoyed alternative music, "Hanging by the Moment" by Lifehouse was number one song of. T- 2001 Interesting. drops of jupiter no not a fan. I'm, I'm not a trained fan to be honest and when i used to set an alarm as a middle schooler for whatever reason at 6 45 when i set my alarm it was na 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 and i just <laughs> i ended up i felt like it was groundhog's day every day i was waking up to the same <laughs> i hate that song Oh, man. All right. Well, that's a valid reason to hate that song. (laughs) All right. So I was very long. We've been very long winded because 2001, the 2000s are just glorious. But let's get into the movies of Mm -hmm. that month and that year. So that month, the same month of um, January that The Wedding Planner came out, uh, Vanilla Sky came out. With Tom Cruise and Penelope Cruz. Mm-hmm. Enigma, have no clue what that is, but Sugar and Spice, which to me is like a teen movie classic, like also another cheerleader classic movie. That's the one where it, one gets pregnant and they rob the bank, right? Yes. Yeah, it that's amazing. Good. <laughs> and then um, earlier in January, we got the iconic Save the Last Dance. <sighs> Yes, which I remember watching when it came on TV because I never got taken to the movies, apparently, or we might have rented it. But it's hilarious because in this day and age, so many people on TikTok have pointed out like how terrible the dance choreography (laughs) is from Save the Last Dance and how gullible we were as youths in that time when we watched it and we were just like, oh, man, she's killing it and she totally no no uh qualms to julia styles but it did not age well so um yeah (laughs) and then and then by the end of it they the judges just look at each other and go like off the record welcome to juilliard i was like that never (laughs) happens that would never happen no No, it would not also it's like one of the first movies for me that i remember um and also J-Lo and Puffy, but like um, interracial couples, Mm -hmm. like that was a big thing for me. I was like, what? Also, I just want to note the flawless ever eternally 20, like her name should be forever 21. Bianca Lawson is in Save the Last Dance, who is also Beyonce's stepsister at this point. And um she's she's the girl that he used to date who's like all bitchy at the club oh. yes yeah. and tell uh tell me what you want from me by mace in total that shit still slaps but <laughs> <laughs> yes and huh. then for 2001 i have added a screenshot of some major movies that came out that year and what jumps out at you Oh, I mean, can I say all of them? We have Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone or Philosopher's Stone if you're from England. Um, (laughs) (laughs) I remember, yeah, we saw that in theaters. It might have been a day of premiere or like if they were doing midnight premieres at that point. Um, I was so salty about that movie because I was so into the first book and, you know, all that harry potter gloriness but the teacher i read that book with i was no longer in her class but her class that year (gasps) they went on a field trip to see harry potter and i was just like devastated and that is like one of the first dvds i got because i was like i need this movie mom (laughs) yeah man i'm not for you that'd be i'd be really salty about that too she took the whole school (laughs) 
Yeah. It, or like, out. or all the classes that would have read it because we definitely listened to that on cassette and then like followed along in the text. Yeah. But yeah, so that's my hair. <laughs> <laughs> um, we also have Lord of the Rings, Fellowship of the Ring. I recently watched the, the trilogy again, director's cut edition. It, it, it's a nice film series that's very lovely produced. I just... I it's it's not a fantasy series that's for me personally. Um we got Monsters Inc. We got Shrek, which is yes. like DreamWorks is hitting its stride at this point. Like, fuck you, ants, like make room for Shrek. <laughs> Shrek is going to dominate um with Oceans Eleven, Pearl Harbor, The Mummy Returns, or should I say <laughs> the Daddy Returns, and Jurassic Park 3. So, I mean, honestly, like, you can name off any of those movies, and I'd be like, yep, 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 all great. Yes, classics in, in the movie department. So, Simone, a big part of movie making is the budget. Can you give us some numbers? What did it cost, and what did it make? Yes. So the budget of this movie was roughly $35 million. On opening weekend, just within the United States, it grossed $13.5 million. So closing box office on January 28th with a 20, January 26th release. But total worldwide gross, including the U.S. and I guess I would be like domestic and international, was about $94.7 million. So... Wow. Overall considered pretty successful, but I wonder how different it would have been if it was released a month later in February as like more of a Valentine's Day movie. Uh, but I it still would have been January release would have carried over. Maybe oh yeah, it definitely still would have been playing over Valentine's weekend. But I'm just wondering if like opening weekend if they would have had more people seeing yeah. it. Yeah. Hmm. Interesting. I am surprised it. Um, because I believe it was like the number one movie at that time. Uh huh. So I, I'm surprised it didn't make that much money the first weekend to be the number one movie. But I mean, it wasn't really in great company either. I doubt Sugar and Spice. Like, I mean, it's a great movie. I like that movie, but like Sugar and Spice, Vanilla Sky, Enigma, I'm I'm not really like. All oh, right, I don't know what I should see. <laughs> <laughs> um well yeah. you know what's interesting so fun fact that kind of relates to the movies that were top of 2001 is that did you know who is going to originally play matthew mcconaughey's character of dr steve yes and i was hoping you didn't find out so i could fun fact you. <laughs> <laughs> all right well fun fact me then pretend i don't know who <laughs> no <laughs> no go ahead play it on us Brendan Fraser, a.k.a. B. Frage, a.k.a. Everyone's Mummy Daddy, was actually set to play Dr. Steve slash Eddie, um, but he had scheduling conflicts earlier when he was making the movie Bedazzled and then like went straight from Bedazzled um, to The Mummy Returns. So he was- uh, That say. makes so much sense. Yes. He was to say. So, Simone, we- watch this movie together which mm -hmm. is the first time we've done this for the uh -huh. podcast so that was fun um but i kind of know what you think about the movie what did the critics think oh <laughs> all right i made sure to keep the tab open for this one because lil raj had a lot of things to say about this movie do you want to guess how many stars Mm, maybe two and a half very close he subtracted a half and gave it two out of five stars i was i was being generous to him giving it a half star but two was like my guess yeah totally so he uh, uh roger ebert has a lot of things to say um a memorable quote to me that kind of sticks out is um that this is the movie cannot abide common sense and it more recycles decades of cliches about the wrong people getting married on and the right ones making stupid decisions um 
He does also say a plot like this is so hopeless that only acting can redeem it. Lopez pulls her share of the load, looking genuinely smitten by this guy and convincingly crushed when his secret is revealed. But McConaughey is not the right actor for this material. Um, he actually suggests that she would have been better off paired with a Ben Affleck, which is interesting because he did this he did this review pre Benifer. Pre Benifer. Um, he also suggested Alec Baldwin, which mm -mm, that would be a no go for me. Ben Stiller, George Clooney, or Matt Dillon. Now I can see I could see George Clooney just based on their chemistry from out of sight. Alec Baldwin, a 2001 Alec Baldwin, maybe. Um, but I think with a Ben Stiller, it would have been too much of a comedy and less about romance. I think it, he would have been too funny. But I think Matt Dillon or George Clooney, out of his suggestions, could have easily fit. I, don't know, I love Matthew McConaughey in this and in, in rom-coms. So, oh, I'm yeah. And Sorry, I think this Raj. was <laughs> I think this was both Jennifer Lopez and Matthew McConaughey's first rom-com um yeah. and I kind of liked their sweet and innocent chemistry although there's a lot of about the movie that I can pick apart kind of similar to like there's a lot that I do agree with uh with Roger Ebert on this one um but he just says that McConaughey was just a little too like a a little too sweet and innocent from from this for for, for this role in particular I'm just I'm wondering like what he wanted <laughs> like I, I think overall he just he was like I, I he feels like the plot was contrived there was too many tropes about romantic comedies that were overused um and too much that there were just things that just didn't really make sense like he too was also very disappointed in the fact that McConaughey slash Dr. Steve does not reveal that he is engaged until, I don't know, halfway through the film at this point. <laughs> yeah. And so he's just like, that was really stupid. <laughs> yeah. I mean, so when we watched it, of course, we were commentating and talking to each other and pointing stuff out like that. And I mean, while while I I can see where you can pick apart a movie like that, part of me is just like, I mean, that's what rom coms are. Like they don't really make sense. They're like very contrived fairy tale versions of what we hope and think love might be. Mm -hmm. And that is why so many of us are so doomed because we're like, I'm waiting on my meat cute. So like when is that gonna happen? That is <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it might not happen, but um, I did cheat a little bit and read some other reviews. I didn't read Ebert's review, but I, I got the sense that most critics were panning the plot and some of the things that happened, some of the lack of comedy things, like it could have been stronger on that side. But I do think it's a pretty romantic movie. Mm -hmm. And I think if it was less... I don't know, less this weird, like two people kind of in semi -re in relation in a relationship and in a weird, like arranged situation, it probably would have worked better because mm -hmm. of that. But yeah. Well, Lil Raj, I, I don't I don't agree with your two stars. So and so what would you oh well we'll get we'll get to that at the end with our pumps of butter <laughs> one one last thing though i will say so when you would ask well, what does he want secretly what lil raj wanted he he thought one of the stupidest parts of the film was when they are walking through the gardens of trying to like find the like they pick the venue and they knock over the statue and the penis of the statue falls off into Matthew McConaughey's hand. And then they tried to super glue it back on and then it gets stuck in his hand. And <laughs> Ebert is like, I would have preferred if if the penis stayed stuck to his hand and that served as some kind of plot device for like later. Like it was one of those things where 
immediately and they couldn't <laughs> come off. <laughs> I mean, that's taking it to like a Steve Martin level of comedy, <laughs> I think, like where it's just like he big said, gags. <laughs> he said, um, Mary has some crazy glue in her purse and they try to glue the franken beans back in place, but alas, the broken part becomes stuck to Steve's palm. If he had gone through the rest of the movie like that, it might have added some interest. <laughs> But no, Mary had some solvent in her purse. When you have seen Jennifer Lopez ungluing marble genitals from the hand of the man she loves, you have more or less seen everything. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I thought that movie was funny for the time. I, I don't know that it adds anything to the story or age as well i did read a review that said they wish that they focused on like in the beginning of the movie how there's that montage of her at the wedding like if they had more elements of comedy due to like the nature of shit going wrong at yeah. weddings mm -hmm. and i i agree i was like that's a good point that would have been more interesting than her walking around with him planning the wedding but they have to like have time together and that was the force of them like realizing this wasn't a fluke and like having chemistry without trying to actually date and stuff so whatever mm -hmm. um so if you don't know the wedding planner if you've never watched it we do have a little synopsis courtesy of the press release which i thought was very official your wedding day it must be glorious it must be perfect it must be the most memorable idyllic and overwhelmingly love-filled occasion of your life and there's only one person who can make this dream become a glowing reality the wedding planner hold on did you write this no, it's the press really. Oh, I was going to say, I was like, this is really good. <laughs> but this time, the one who makes everyone else's dreams come true, A-list San Francisco wedding planner, Mary Fiore, played by Jennifer Lopez, has finally found the man of her dreams. Or has she? While celebrating her newest and most lucrative account, the wedding of internet tycoon Fran Donnelly, played by Bridget Wilson Sampras, Mary is rescued from a near fatal collision with a runaway dumpster by handsome <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I'm just thinking of a runaway dumpster of like. <laughs> Oh my god, that's that it's a funny image. <laughs> it is, it is funny. <laughs> by handsome pediatrician Steve Edison, played by Matthew McConaughey. After spending the most enchanting evening of their lives together, Mary thinks she finally found a reason to believe in love. What she doesn't know is that Cupid and her career are about to collide head on in the wedding planner. Dun dun. And I mean, okay, so that is not a movie trailer, but doesn't doesn't that get the juices flowing? You're like, ah, this sounds. I'm intrigued. I mean, I outwardly, outwardly, the description was good, and I saw this movie as a kid in the theaters. I think I saw it at a sleepover. I was not with my parents, and the I, but I do remember that my friends parents telling my mom the next day of what we saw and then just like she gave my mom a little heads up about the genitals part <laughs> like by the way this happened in the theater okay all right here take your child back <laughs> bye bye <laughs> oh my god but yeah i so that's the synopsis of the movie if you haven't seen the wedding planner shame on you what were you doing in the 2000s okay <laughs> if you weren't watching rom-coms um so let's talk about the cast obviously we have j-lo we have matthew mcconaughey and his first rom-com but i think the first of many to me he is one of the like main rom-com guys that consistently is turning them out also i watched how to lose a guy in 10 days friday because it was on bravo so i was like yes oh my god i'll just a little matthew mcconaughey uh rom-com marathon sign me up um but so you mentioned earlier that brendan fraser was supposed to play dr steve edison mm -hmm. 
But did you know also that he was supposed to play him alongside Jennifer Love Hewitt? Oh, no. I read someone else in the role or who was up for the role in addition to Jennifer Lopez. I didn't know Jennifer Love Hewitt was going to originally play. So allegedly that's who he was paired with. And then (laughs) after that didn't happen, it was supposed to be Freddie Prince Jr. and Sarah Michelle Gellar. And that didn't work out for some reason. So then we get Jennifer Lopez and Matthew McConaughey. Mm -hmm. To me, I'm like, I'm glad it worked out that way. Because I'm also surprised, like Kate Hudson, that he hasn't done another movie with her. Mm -hmm. Although in an interview, or like they were talking about The Wedding Planner 20 years later, um, Jayla did say, like, we need to do something together again. It's been too long. And I am... I'm in the movie with popcorn and sour patch kids ready. I would, I would. M&Ms. Oh yeah. I mean, yeah, I'm ready with my pumps of butter for that one. I would see them again. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I don't have too many qualms about the casting of anything. I think Matthew, to me, I like Matthew McConaughey in this movie, despite Lil Rogers, uh <laughs> disagreement. Um, I le- when we were watching it, I pointed it out to me that um Bridget Wilson Sampras's character Fran Donnelly reminded me a lot of Meredith Blake from The Parent Trap so Mm -hmm. bravo on that casting except she wasn't as bitchy no actually a good bride yeah I don't think she was mean I think she just was like a rich girl who wanted a really bougie wedding and felt kind of forced to like make it happen and get married fast yeah yeah which reminds you of meredith and her parents when they go to ironically in san francisco oh yeah so very meredith blake vibes with sans like evil potential stepmother vibes um Mm -hmm. we had a young justin chambers as massimo Mm -hmm. with his uh brilliant (laughs) italian accent yeah he got ripped apart for that one it was pretty bad I imagine so. so yeah, yeah. I mean, honestly, as someone who doesn't really know what to expect and as a child, I thought it was great, <laughs> but I'm sure it's not very authentic. Well, and I think an Italian accent's one of those things that is so over stereotypicalized and and I don't think that's a word, but I'm gonna say it anyways, it and that it's so overdone and easy to kind of overdo. Um, kind of like faking a really heavy southern accent, accent or a French oh, yeah. accent or something. And it's a, a overplaying an Italian accent can be really easy to do but it's like a very fine cross of like you don't sound authentic at all like you sound like you're someone who's making fun of an italian <laughs> yeah but, yeah totally yeah i think I because don't... massimo is like a sweet person gen genuinely uh, he, that he didn't come across as like douchey yeah so props to them not writing him like that i also am curious like why they didn't I mean, I, I can't think of an Italian actor off the top of my head, but, you know, why not give that opportunity to someone else who fit, who could have did it properly? But um, what about also- Paolo from <laughs> Lucy McGuire? <laughs> nope, just kidding. Was he even Italian? He probably wasn't even Italian. <laughs> um but also we get Judy Greer as Jennifer Lopez's co-worker, Penny who I think Judy Greer is always somebody's quirky sidekick best friend. So I was like, oh, there she is. Also, which is funny, is in the in How to Lose a Guy in 10 Days, you have Katherine Hahn. And they mm-hmm. are like totally interchangeable in that role, like of quirky, weird best friend. And they are very aware of that with each other, that th- their careers are pretty much like, it's it's me and you back and forth yep. pretty much mm-hmm. um who else i noticed lou myers just because he was on a different world and he had some funny one-liners also, also kathy najimi mm-hmm. from 
hocus pocus. Do you want to say what you thought about her hair in this movie? <laughs> yes, I I do not. Sorry, Kathy. I do not think you look good as a blonde. It did not work for me. So. The styling of it too is very like mullety and I want to speak to your manager I didn't I, I agree I didn't care for it. Yeah. And I mean I also kind of didn't buy her as like some like high level wedding planning business owner boss lady like mm-hmm. but i mean like i expected basically a another version of mary times 10 in like oh, more like even more type a did you know that the that the groomsman that mary was like feeding the speech lines into in that movie is her husband it's Kathy's husband? Kathy's husband, yeah, in real life. Oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> wow. That's a fun fact. <laughs> so uh, you had a question. Would you rather, um, with the cast, Matthew McConaughey or Justin Chambers? Mm-hmm. Um, I had already said Matthew McConaughey, but I'm going to flip it on you. Who would you rather? I'm going to cop. I'm going to say the same thing as you are. I'm going Matthew McConaughey. I think he would be an interesting romp in the hay. I think he would. I would. I just would like to go to his house. I think that he would have a really nice wine and liquor selection. Like he probably has some really nice. Not that I drink this, but really (laughs) nice like bourbons and whiskeys, like sipping tequilas or something like I can see him having. Yes, he probably has peyote. (laughs) probably yeah like i feel like he has peyote and like a water bed so like if you had a sleepover at his house even if you weren't going to be doing anything sexual it would just be like i'm having a great time at matthew mcconaughey's house yeah i just matthew mcconaughey is like i'm not 100 percent sure what enigma means but i'm pretty sure he's an enigma yeah he's he, his own thing yeah and I will say that, like, the story of him getting arrested for playing his congas naked is just (laughs) iconic and just, I mean, talk about a romantic fantasy. Like, that sounds hot to me. (laughs) (laughs) And then um, his, when, before he got married to Camilla Owls, he was very much like the beach guy. And Mm -hmm. I believe he lived in an Airstream, which I just thought, like, that, that just screams cool. He just seems like a cool guy and adventurous and you definitely would like have some stories to tell after dating him. Like totally. And Justin Chambers I think is attractive, but he falls on the line of too pretty boy for me. Cuz wasn't he he was like a Calvin Klein model. Was he? I, I think, didn't know that. I think he was. I just know I just know him from Grey's Anatomy really, but yeah. um Justin Chambers I think he's good looking too. Um but yeah, Matthew McConaughey has the personality. Like he has an edge. There, yeah, there's an interview with him and Jennifer Lopez. I want to say it's for Cosmopolitan, where they were the cover story, and so it was them and it was him and her, and they both answered the same questions, and his answers are just quintessential. <laughs> like, you're just like a teenager, just like. Ugh. I want to date a guy like that like just different and you know not standard and you're just like yes mm-hmm. a plus Matthew um so we both this time watched interviews and more so so that like I kind of know what you're talking about or vice versa but I'm gonna lead you let you lead the conversation on uh cast interviews yes all right so the one that I had um, kind of talked with you about earlier was the um, E! Uh, Entertainment live interview, um, kind of more of like a press junket style interview, but it was her, uh, Jennifer Lopez, Matthew McConaughey, and Justin Chambers together. Um, and which, I don't know, I feel like poor Bridget got a little shade Aww. there. <laughs> yeah. like. Being fourth build is one thing, but I feel like she plays just as big of a role as Massimo does. I can yeah. under- obviously understand like the two leading roles, but I'm like, oh, I don't know. I would have liked to have seen her. Um, Cause I know 
Judy Greer has done not maybe necessarily interviews for this film, but when she like goes on, you know, talk shows, she's talked about her experiences and all of her little side parts and some of her like favorite actors and actresses to work with. And she had said when she met Jennifer Lopez that she was like so starstruck and like really nervous to work with her. (laughs) Oh, and she's she looks so young here. So I, I can imagine like she probably she's not the judy greer we like know as of now obviously Mm -hmm. so and j-lo's star was very much risen at this time so i can imagine being starstruck by her (laughs) she hath risen yes this this. was post grammy's dress and from there everything was just like on fire she's on fire (laughs) makes me think of grand theft auto (laughs) (laughs) Um, so in that e news air in that e interview, um, they talked about like what was the overall message of the film and something that Jennifer Lopez had said, which I thought was really interesting because it's almost like a strange foreshadowing to some of her later relationships, was that she had said, "I think the message is don't settle for what you think life is supposed to be," and she goes on to say, "We all give up." Um, you know, as we 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 get older, we kind of give up this dream and fantasy um, and that if you've been with someone for a long time, that it feels just kind of like, oh, it's a logical step. Let's might as well. We might as well get married. Um, but she's like, but it's a really big decision and one that should be thought of like very carefully and stuff. And I was like, I don't know. I just thought that that was very interesting because she is someone who's infamous, infamously known for her dating history, which we will get to in a special mini up. But um, what do you think? I, I I did kind of like oh, okay, take your own advice, Jennifer. Yeah, <laughs> but I have also watched so many interviews at this point of Jennifer Lopez talking somewhat about her love life and in a very current newer at least post 2019 interview I'm not sure the year she has said that she has learned that um her dating style is very much to like to deal with a breakup is to find someone new to help her deal with that so she's Mm -hmm. very much like skip into the next relationship and she's like she really believes in love and she's a monogamous. So it's not like fleeing situations. She's very much like jumping into a full on relationship. Usually it's not a casual, like, okay, you helped me get over this breakup. Bye. They usually last pretty long and either turn into something or, you know, fizzle out or whatever. But um, I just think that's part of like, her at this point and she knows that about herself so props to her for being Mm self-aware as we know as of right now she just broke up with Alex Rodriguez Mm -hmm. so part of me is like I I'm glad you're self-aware but I don't know that you've learned (laughs) anything from your past situations but I commend her as someone who is very hesitant about dating myself I commend her for being able to jump into relationships and overlook a lot of stuff or seemingly, I think, overlook a lot of stuff. In an interview, she did say like, you know, sometimes you overlook stuff and you're like, oh, but I really like him. Um, And you give them the benefit of the doubt. But anyways, yeah. So I I think that's an interesting, like, oh, hmm. Yeah. (laughs) And like what you had brought up earlier about um the the just general chemistry that McConaughey and Lopez had in this film I thought I thought it was good I didn't think it was as good as George Clooney but that's just my personal opinion but I still think that like as much as I love Brandon Fraser Matthew McConaughey just seemed right for this kind of role and it was a really good jumping platform for both of them to get into that romantic comedy world um, because it yeah. can be kind of difficult to get into but I think it can be just as hard to get out of once you're like typecasted into these like rom-com pretty boy silly girl kind of 
uh, kind of roles. But one thing that I thought was really cute is that this film premiered right when the Golden Globes were happening. And even though this movie was not up for any nominations because it was just about to be released, they went to the Golden Globes together as like a yes, little friend they did. couple. <laughs> I thought that was cute. And um, part of me was like, oh, mm. like sometimes that's a promo move, you know, to put the stars like on the red carpet together so that they can interview together and answer questions. And it allows fans to buy into, you know, the on-screen romance of it all. And I mean, hold, hold the phone. Look at this. I think they do look really cute together. Yes. So I, Mm -hmm. I I added another picture because now Uh I'm just like, now I'm like, oh, what well, could have been? Yeah, but I, uh, his I jawline is so good. Please Google Jennifer Lopez Golden Globe 2001, and you will come across uh, plenty of pictures of her and Matthew McConaughey together at the Golden Globes, looking like a possible uh, a possible couple. Well, things between her and P Diddy were kind of on the rocks by this point because, and yes, and I know again we'll get that in more in depth in that mini up that someone had asked like oh where's sean where's puff daddy and he had i think where the golden globes are held um he had like put a bunch of like posters or like put like billboard pictures yeah to like kind of be like hey i'm not here with you at this uh premiere but i am like gonna show you that i'm spending my money on you and that i'm supporting you in other ways but it felt like he was never really with her for like movie stuff it was more for like music events yeah yeah that is true because their big you know things i remember are the grammys which is musical the vmas which Uh is musical Uh um they did not go to the golden globes or the oscars together i don't think so and I believe she said he was at um, a company retreat. Or yeah. Something? Yes. 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 Because someone, I think he was either like that really skeevy Jay Leno interview, or someone had asked her about it. And she's like, oh, he was on a retreat. And I kind of like the idea of thinking about like, she probably asked Puff Daddy to go first. He said, no, I'm going on this business retreat. And then she calls up Matthew and be like, hey do you want to come with me to the gold like i don't know i just think of this like very innocent thing of like will you come with me to the golden globes i think it would be really fun and i could just see them like like talking shit about people be like (laughs) just kind of having fun yeah stakes like you're just there to look good and enjoy and whatever yeah i um i also was i gonna say oh in the golden globes interview of them on the red carpet together the guy the male interviewer um the guy kind of asked her like a thing about like she's like oh you've been kind of in the press a lot lately about some incidents and you can tell j-lo is like so uncomfortable because um the shooting incident with her and puff daddy in the club happened and obviously she's there to promote her job her work and her film and she's not even with him at at attending Mm -hmm. but he still brings it up and it's funny because i think she handled it really well you can see she's uncomfortable but at the same time their conversation kind of gets very low in the audio Mm -hmm. and you can barely hear like some of the stuff he's asking her and and but she's like very like straight to the point just like yeah but you know blah 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 like and there's always stuff in the press about me yeah she yeah. she she's a really good interviewer now that we've had the chance to watch a lot of her different stuff like she's very natural at answering questions she's very personable very likable um very and perky. It, yeah it didn't it doesn't sound like it's too rehearsed and um i'm guessing you watched the jay leno interview <laughs> okay to quote my own self um my soul has left my body after watching that interview, we might just make a small segment on this show about how much I fucking hate Jay Leno. Just, just I, alone ragging on Jay Leno's interviews with Jennifer Lopez. Oh my <laughs> god! Yeah. So I mean, what's not to hate when he? So Jennifer is wearing this like really pretty like 
black gaucho pants and a white blouse, but her white blouse is unbuttoned to sh show a like a bralette cami underneath. And that's the first thing he talks about is like, oh, I like your, I like your, and Jennifer's like, what, my bra? Because that's what you're looking at. Like, yes. she's so <laughs> open about it. And he's just like, well, that's the thing. Like, guys are in a tough decision because we don't know if we're supposed to look there or not. And then he's like, let me just get it out of the way. And, like, openly looks at her breasts. He pulls up pictures of her in Vanity Fair and Rolling Stone. And she's wearing almost like a Princess Leia kind of, like, in the dungeon outfit where with, like, the – it's like a matching bra and underwear set. And she's holding a sword. And so he's like, oh, very like, you like to be in those kind of dominant roles, dominant. Yeah. Gross. And, <laughs> um, and then he does point out something that we've alluded to about JLo, that she is really comfortable in herself, that she is comfortable in her own skin. And um, he's like, well, you seem like someone who's very comfortable, like not like all those other whiny women out there who hate their bodies. Oh, my God. I hated and, that. And I was like, it's like fuckers like you that we get these quote unquote whiny women who hate himself like and you know <laughs> what i want to say in 2021 i just bravo to young people millennials gen z everybody for recognizing like on tiktok I, i'm gonna mention tiktok a lot <laughs> as a reference point but on tiktok people are like you know what i realize if i stopped caring about the male gaze mm -hmm. I feel so much better and I, I will dress how I want to dress or not feel like I can't do this or that because, you know, men are going to look at me or blah, blah, blah. And I think that him saying that is the epitome of that. We uh -huh. get shit on whether we look, we're confident like JLo or we're self-conscious like other women. And the reason most of the time we're self-conscious is not other women it's men. And I just want to say, even though women can be catty, a lot of times that's still male like driven because we're pit against each other in a way where it's like, well, if she's being slutty and I'm not, then clearly she's going to get the attention that I kind of want, but I'm not confident enough to put myself out there like that. And at the root of it is all attention of men. Mm hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. fucking -lutely. I could not agree more. It's so. <laughs> and I think that's one thing that I have really appreciated with since the Me Too movement that there has been a, a shift. It's not perfect, but there has been a shift in the types of interview questions that women get and the oh. types of interview questions that men get and that. um that people are being held more accountable for their actions. I I guess as a total side note that has nothing to do with this podcast, I just, from the body image issues that you and I have and everyone else in our generation have worked through, um, I just hope for, for younger Gen Zs or Gen, uh, Generation Alpha, you know, like our, like my current students, that there are enough positive influencers out there that they don't have to like I just want this cycle to end so bad yeah I I do and I know that um watching was it watching the movie yes, yes watching that the opening movie. scene the first spoken line of this is a bride who's being who's getting ready for her big day and she's like I look so fat and then I looked at you as we we're FaceTiming watching this movie and I'm like, God, <laughs> like, <laughs> ah, this is why, this is why we have, men. like, it's, what's, what's that TikTok? I think this is gonna fuck with me. This is gonna <laughs> mess with me mentally. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god theme song of my life absolutely yes that and she's like bitching about her thighs which lady you're in a wedding dress no one can see your thighs no one can like, see your thighs no one can see your thighs but i mean even even consuming j-lo content from the early 2000s like so much of this time period is you know, abs and midriff and crop tops and low rise jeans. And oh, God, Gen Z, you don't know what you're doing trying to bring some of this shit back. Like, you really don't. We yeah. have ventured into high rise and 
dates and um stuff like that for a reason <laughs> like i hope to god if these low-rise jeans with the microscopic zipper as mama yamshan oh used to say or like remember the Lord like the shoestring ones like yeah the lace-up ones i saw I want to say either JLo was performing or I think, I think she was performing that I watched and she had on a pair like that with like the lace up front. And I was just like, Oh God, (laughs) no, it looks great on her, but I'm just like, God, yes, no, no one else could wear that. No, no, it's just, it sets such a sad and unrealistic expectation. And maybe that's why I tend to like, shy away from rom-coms now because the past i haven't seen a lot i want to say maybe the last romantic comedy i watched was train wreck starring amy schumer and um bill Hader. but amy schumer like has her own thing going on in yeah. terms of like body stuff but like i don't know i, I that's why i kind of shied away from it because it just used these tropes about wanting to appeal to the male gaze which i think is a really good segment into our next into our next segment about like focusing on jennifer's role how it compares to her other roles this is her first rom-com and if this movie would hold up to today yes 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 so let's get into the acting chops of none other than than jennifer lopez um i guess i'll go first I I don't know if this how true this is for this movie because I also tried to look this up, but it's said on IMDb that Jayla was nominated for a Razzie for Worst Actress. Aww. And I'm like, this movie isn't even that bad. It's not <laughs> like, bad. I wouldn't go as far as giving her a Razzie. I thought she was really cute. Yeah. I I I do think um that some of the reviews I read like the type A-ness of this character, like her role in Out of Sight, definitely. I feel like she's very strong and like focused, helps um, helps her in this role. And then the soft, softness um, kind of of the cell, it's like a beautiful mashup of those last two roles in a way, mm-hmm. because even though she's like the straight-laced wedding planner who's like very business, 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 Matthew McConaughey's character brings out this soft like I want to be in love and I want to find love side of her and um I think it was done beautifully I think um she looks great in the movie so many beautiful hairstyles and outfits that are very timely for that era I know we one talked about the purple turtleneck and how great she looked in purple Mm -hmm. and just turtlenecks in general are like her thing I feel like yeah J-Lo can rock a turtleneck like nobody and it's funny I was watching her carpool karaoke before we started recording (laughs) and guess what she's wearing a turtleneck turtleneck. (laughs) you know what I love about that carpool karaoke is when James Corbin like turns to her and is like who's the most famous person in your phone (laughs) and it's Leonardo DiCaprio and he's like text him text him and then she says you want to hang out tonight he goes what like club wise boo boo like (laughs) i want to see j-lo and leonardo DiCaprio at a club so bad but anyways i think one one thing i'm really beginning to notice and love about her film acting maybe the sell aside because there was some like very crazy makeup and theatrical things we've seen her like as a very soft character and soft in terms of like very light makeup it's very natural um and it you just you can't you I feel like you can't really go wrong with how you dress her or like put her up in makeup because when she's on the red carpet or when she's doing a music video or performing for the VMA she's have she has really heavy stage makeup big eyelashes and things like that but for a wedding planner it was very like blushy and soft and sweet and she she just looks so fucking pretty in this movie yeah oh yeah totally like i think to me this besides selena obviously this movie is like epitome 2000s j-lo to me Mm -hmm. like 
and it's like the height really of like everything about who she had become at that point so Mm -hmm. um we have lighter hair she's no longer like a brunette really anymore at this stage she's got highlights which we commented on we did some like kind of chunky (laughs) (laughs) uh chunky honey kind of highlights which for her i think we're not bad but for all the all the young girls trying to mimic the highlights of that that era just a chunky mess (laughs) but um just such light colors like pastels very it's very bridal like kind of similar colors that you would see in like like wedding parties yes that is that is very true even um even um god what's what's her name even Bridget Wilson Sampras's character. What's her name? What's her name? What's her character? Oh, Fran. Name? Fran Donnelly. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so even Fran Don- Donnelly's character, I feel like, evokes the same like uh, color palette, like the gray suit and stuff mm-hmm. like that. Also, I mean, we talked about it a little bit, but like the Range Rover, God, like I want, I want that life. <laughs> <laughs> I like to be driving through Napa in a beautiful cashmere, like cream sweater with my fiance. Mm-hmm. And yes, give it to me. But so, how did how do you think this compared to other roles that we've watched so far? I've been waiting to watch this movie in this lineup. Um, I've thoroughly enjoyed going through this journey thus far. Um, but when I think of iconic rom-com movies uh wedding planner made in manhattan how to lose a guy in 10 days like the those were those were ones that really stood out to me and so i was just looking and it's been so long since i've seen this movie and so it was really fun for me to go back and rewatch it even though i do think that there were things that were problematic but (laughs) i liked i loved i liked her character i liked her vulnerability of being um someone who is very like good at what she does but that when we see a sneak peek of her life behind the scenes of eating a nice meal and watching antiques roadshow which is perfectly fine (laughs) (laughs) as a single woman to do um that we see that there's this side of her which i don't think she felt necessarily incomplete i think she just was so career driven she knew what she wanted to do but then it wasn't until she had had this weird dumpster meat cute that she was like oh i'm ready for a second chance at love because she had also said as her character that she's seen time and time and again these relationships not working out she can predict like if a couple's going to get divorced or if someone if there's infidelity in there and i don't know i liked it i liked it yeah, and I love when um, they're picking, like, their song, and she's like, oh, and that song, God, like, awful. <laughs> <laughs> um, so one of the reviews I happened to stumble upon was from the New York Times, and I had to pull it up because I'm like, what was that quote? Because it was really good, and I think it captures really, like, JLo's performance in The Wedding Planner. And um, it says that... Well, maybe I should start above here. Mm -hmm. So her greatest skill as an actress and the key to her brain addling sexiness may be her ability to melt without cracking the hard shell of composure she wears like a perfectly tailored suit. And that's the part that I think that stuck with me and I wanted to look up again because I was like, this is this exactly explains this character and kind of a J-Lo too that she has this ability to to be like really focused and sometimes like tough and cutthroat but she also has this ability to be soft and that only adds to like the duality because she could totally be the hot bitchy lady in movies right but most of her roles have this like duality of like she's tough and like very composed 
but at the same time you see like little peeks through the cracks of this like outer shell and I think this movie is a great opportunity for that to shine yeah I agree she's tough but not in the sense that we've seen her as like a cop tough or um like even even in U-turn where she had some like really kind of more sad and tragic backstory given to her i think that um this was a toughness that had a different kind of depth and meaning behind it because she was stood up she she did kind of experience some misfortune in her love life um but at the same time reveals a softness underneath And I don't think that it was too stereotypical in the sense that, like, it wasn't trying, I personally don't feel like it was trying to play on this sense that this is all what all girls dream about is getting married. Um, Because I think as kids, we definitely fell for that of yeah this is what you're supposed to do you're supposed to be a girl and you dream of your big beautiful wedding day and your big dress and your groom and your party and all that stuff but um she thought about that as a kid but then realized like oh i'm actually really good at planning weddings and she takes her (laughs) tragedy and mishap and turns it into like being a a co-owner yeah a career a partner (laughs) I will say that one of the things pointed out in some of the reviews was like the flimsiness of her running into her ex-fiance. I do think they could have introduced that earlier. And I think the perfect way Mm -hmm. to have done that was to have her father mention it when he wants to set her up with Massimo Uh to be like, hey, look, I know you had your heart broken before. Like that would have been perfect because the flower scene, the flower mark scene, while it is funny and comically like, you know, like uh it also is like, oh okay like she was engaged before like that would have been nice to know yes so instead of like going off of her mother's death and like her father wanting to see her married before he dies not that he's that old but just that like he wants to see his baby daughter grow up and he knows someone that could be potentially a match and he reveals that him and his mother or him and um Uh, Jennifer Lopez, Mary's mother, um, were an arranged marriage. And so even though it seems like an outdated idea that it could still possibly work, that they weren't madly in love with each other at first, but then they grew into it and became, you know, madly in love with one another. And so I think if they didn't play so much on that piece and had it more focus on like i know you've had your heart broken before that this has happened to you but like you got to get yourself out there and have another chance just like picking a lane you know which is just like another rom-com trope to be honest yeah i think it would have worked better though and i just think you can't, you can't really you can't separate yourself from the formula like rom-coms are formulaic movies just like just like action movies are you know so in speaking of which if it's if we're following a particular recipe or something that's a little bit more contrived maybe i just avoid these types of movies and you can absolutely correct me if i'm wrong but i feel like in this year in 2021 we haven't seen too many of those stereotypical recipe factory made rom-com movies so do you think that it would this movie would hold its own in 2021 and if not like what might you tweak about it to make it be more of a modern twist so i'm i'm gonna i'm gonna quote semi loosely quote jennifer lopez herself because uh, on youtube there is a video of her and matthew mcconaughey talking about the 20th anniversary of the wedding planner and it's a very casual conversation it's just them they're not being interviewed it's just them they're like the facetiming with, with each other right or it's like yes. an instagram live thing yeah yes which i think is awesome because it shows like that 
they had a great time making this movie. And I think they both continuously say that whenever it's brought up is that they enjoyed making it together and had fun and enjoyed each other's company. And the fact that they can call each other up and FaceTime live 20 years later to talk about it is amazing. Um, But Jennifer Lopez was talking about, because Matthew... I think Matthew McConaughey was wrong because he was in other rom-coms after this, but he was like, yeah, I think the wedding planner was like one of the last like rom-coms really like, you know, there weren't too many at that time. And I'm like, bro, it was only just getting started. (laughs) Right. I I understand like the sleepless in Seattle, the you got males, but you were in how to lose a guy in 10 days, failure to launch fool's gold like homeboy you had a career that was pretty (laughs) much rom-coms for a solid chunk so like you think dallas buyers club is what built you no you you (laughs) have your co-leading ladies of of rom-coms to thank for that yes and the women who went to go see them to thank and yes yeah agreed we're like who were swooning over, you know, Dr. Uh, Stephen Edison or, Mm -hmm. um, you know, Benjamin in How to Lose a Guy in 10 Days. But so, yeah, I just had to point that out. But J-Lo, she does say, like, she loves the rom-com and she thinks that it, you know, it did die a bit and she wants to see it come back and she's doing one currently. I think she's working on one that would come out sometime after this year maybe and she wants to do another one with Matthew McConaughey but I think um I think also Matthew McConaughey mentions he's like with the year that has happened and stuff like that I think people need like just light feel good the happy ending happens type of movies and I think this is the perfect time to bring back romantic comedies and I I agree with that because I feel like we've been in a movie world of in movie and tv world of really gritty hard realistic things and like trying to tell like these really poignant realistic true based on true story stories and I think because of like the Sopranos that shift happened, you know. I think that rom-coms deserve to come back. I, for one, in this Panini Press, have enjoyed watching things that allow me to escape reality. And that includes watching old stuff and watching stuff from other countries, watching, not watching, like watching reality TV right now is it's great because it's like other people's problems, but now they're filming through COVID. So a lot of stuff is like talking about COVID or they have masks and they have face shields. Then you're just like, Oh God, this is kind of weird to be reliving this. Mm -hmm. So like they're in early COVID and we're like in vaccination land of COVID, Mm -hmm. but it's like kind of triggering still because it's not over, but we're in a different pl- place, but you're still seeing that. And God, I, there, oh, I don't know if it's a ra- romantic comedy, but there was some COVID based love. Oh, yeah. Movie. It was on like Freeform or. It yeah. Was and I was just show. like, no, no, do no, not no, do no. that. Yeah. And <laughs> I liked your point about what Matthew McConaughey had said in this year's interview about the. 20th anniversary of this film about like how we just I think we owe it to ourselves to kind of bring back something that's a little bit more lighthearted. Um, I think in the past year, I have gravitated towards like things that are more just dumb and funny and kind of mindless. I often yeah. say like, I just want to watch a mindless comedy. I want something that's going to make me laugh. I want something that's going to make me tune out. Like I could play a little Candy Crush or something while I'm watching it. So I don't have to give like my full attention. <laughs> yeah. That being said, like in addition to all the other true crime and like scary stuff that we are watching, I think that this world that we're living in now is true crimey enough that we are almost way too overloaded with scary news, depressing news, things that make us sad and angry and hurt and and 
feel motivated hopeless. and hopeless yeah. yeah but then at the same time so that yeah we do we're looking for something that's a little bit more easygoing um and i do take that back i think the last rom-com that i watched was always be my maybe ali wong's movie oh i i watched that which was cute and so that i did might have been the last one i oh actually there's um to all the boys i loved before count that would count i would say yeah yeah i watched those too because i read the books because <laughs> i'm too old to read those books but whatever. <laughs> i was gonna say i was like i have those in my classroom library <laughs> No shame, but, um, no shame. But yeah, I and you know what? I didn't I realized while I was listening to you, I did not do while we watched this movie. I did not think like, oh, that wouldn't happen because of this, or why is blah blah blah. Besides like him not divulging that he was engaged and her not clearly being like, I'm not engaged to Massimo. Like we are not engaged. Yes. FYI. Like don't listen to him this is the truth besides those two things i did not pick apart this movie with like you know realistic expectations i did get lost in just the and i don't know if it's because i've seen it before and just nostalgia helped guide me there where i didn't have to be jaded whereas if i watch a current rom-com i might pick it apart still but actually, you know what? I feel like you just get lost in these kind of movies and yeah. realistic or not, you just, you want it to be real. So you, that suspension of disbelief is like high, especially as a woman, I think. I think it's as high as it is for men in action movies where they're like, yeah, that car would totally make that jump. And then <laughs> I could gun a car through the window of a high-rise building into the window of another high-rise building one city block away. I could do that in my Dodge Charger, said Vin Diesel. Or like you miraculously are dodging bullets and diving and shooting people spot on like headshots <laughs> like, so like call of duty yes that is realistic uh, but yeah so to answer the question long-windedly it feels like we both agree the rom-com deserves a comeback especially in this climate and mm -hmm. we think that it could that this movie could come back come out and hold up or at least holds up today um i know you asked me if i if this came out today what would i want to see change or stay the same um i think the two things we talked about him divulging that he's engaged and her staunchly being like i'm not engaged to massimo i don't think that that changing that affects the outcome of the movie i do agree though with someone they mentioned that the fact that they're engaged and they're planning a wedding and she's helping them plan a wedding it makes it hard for you to root for her and dr steve to be together you know like so like in how to lose a guy in 10 days when i just watched it the whole time you're like god you know that they're both like kind of they're playing each other on purpose yeah but at the same time you have like those moments you have the huge moment where she visits his family and kind of like they she's actually like have fun. actually yeah and so it's easy to like want like despite it coming to a boil at the end wanting them to like no like you guys really like each other though and wanting them to fix it and just and in the wedding planner it's similar like he realizes i can't marry fran like i'm really into mary and i want that to i want to figure that out but i feel like part of it because mary doesn't have that same realization we didn't get married yeah um, the person I who have, spoke out at their little civil wedding elopement yes. was her dad the very yeah. person who's trying to set it up he's like uh i'm sorry i think i made a mistake yes and Don't then i love it. that lou myers like hell woo goddamn i was gonna say something <laughs> <laughs> well i think that was kind of like reversely that was matthew mcconaughey's dr steve edison's like one redeeming quality is that fran did also have those doubts because there was a moment where fran went to 
Mary's office and was like, I don't think I could go through with it. I don't think like I've only I'm going to this is the one man I'm going to sleep with for the rest of my life. And I realize I don't like the way he grinds his teeth and does this and that and that. And yeah. I think those are like natural like what Nerves. if I think everyone gets a little nervous before the wedding, but like to actually have doubts is something that's very different. I don't feel like anyone should have doubts, hopefully, before yeah. they get married. Um, but that was what excused Matthew McConaughey to be like, I'm sorry, Fran, I got to go explore this. Like if she was legitly like I think about I was thinking about this actually on our drive when you and I saw each other <laughs> this afternoon, <laughs> this morning. About I thought about the movie Enchanted, um, Disney's movie Enchanted, and how Idina Menzel's character legitly loved Dr. McDreamy, Dr. McSteamy. I don't know his real name. Patrick Dempsey. Thank you. <laughs> Patrick Dempsey's character. Like she really wanted to be in his life and get invested with his daughter. And then he falls in love with Giselle. <laughs> and then Giselle like is looking for Edward falls out of love with Edward and back in love with Patrick Dempsey's character. And then like poor Edward and Idina Menzel at the end of the movie, James Marsden, whatever. And Idina Menzel are both kind of like- James Marsden, I was getting the short end of the stick. I put him in a romantic comedy and make it work. James Marsden would be great. I think he's so dopey and cute. And like, so they just kind of look at each other and they're like, all right, like, I guess we can make this work and like he takes her into the cartoon world so like i think about that movie and i'm like you know what patrick dempsey like fuck you like that was really <laughs> cheap and really shitty and like you owe it to your girlfriend of x amount of years and fiance of x amount of years to like owe her some kind of explanation so It'd be one thing if Idina had some kind of doubts like Fran did, where she came in and she was like, actually, I don't know, is this a good idea? And then like Mary gives her that pep yeah. talk. But then um, but then on the day of the wedding, Dr. Steve Eddie goes to see Fran as soon as she's getting ready. And he's like, let's go for a walk. And they both kind of like talk each other out of it and come to a place of mutual decision and mutual agreement that like yeah we're probably rushing into these things rather than being like i'm sorry fran i don't love you i gotta go take a taxi to go find this yeah. other lady i i do respect that they had a conversation about it yeah i think that i would change that it would be fran who wanted to talk to him because yes. she was yes she it would be her having... decision Yes. And I think when we were watching it, I was like, oh man, if only she was the one who like was the issue because then it's not on him solely being like, oh, he fell in love with the wedding planner. But to be fair, if she went to him first and had said like, I'm sorry, I don't think this is going to work. He'd be like, oh, okay. And then use that as his opportunity to like sneak out and not say anything so i do appreciate the fact that he was very open about like i don't think this is right i i, I mean i still think they could have had the conversation like she wouldn't just be like look i'm i can't do this i'm bouncing see you and then mm -hmm. he's like okay well i guess i could head to city hall in time <laughs> like i do think that if they still had the conversation and he was like yeah i think you're right. like the same just reversed it might be a little more you're like yes rooting for like him to be able to make it to marry yeah um almost like almost like meredith blake in in parent trap or i'm thinking of the the olsen twin movie it takes two oh, when yeah. when their dad was going to get married to that one person and then um christy alley christy like alley. bursts in <laughs> i gotta rewatch that man it's been a while but yeah i just i feel like that was a little anticlimactic in like yeah. being like you gotta get her like so i would i would want to change that a bit um i do agree with like adding more funny parts about wedding planning in there um i think would be funny i don't know how you do that without detracting from the romance part of it um I don't know. I don't know that I would change very much about this movie. I just, I do think that it would be very unrealistic for 2021. And yeah, I mean, well, I don't know. So a lot of couples have had to put their weddings off due to COVID. So what if they had something where they realized that they're engaged and 
they were supposed to get married on a certain date, but then had to defer their wedding, like not even months, but like years away. And then in that time, they realized that they like can't, that they're not compatible. I mean, that's more of like a sad movie. I don't know where the yeah. comedy would be in that, but that's like, that's the only thing that I can think of in terms to like fit that motif for 2021. Yeah, I don't know. I guess, yeah, it could it could be remade and still hold its own. Um, so let's talk about the trailer for yes. The Wedding Planner. Okay. Uh, well, like many trailers in this time, um, it doesn't necessarily give the whole plot away, but we do know, I mean, we know how usual rom-coms are going to end up. Um, the trailer has the... Um, dumpster moment with the dumpster running downhill Matthew McConaughey saving her um, in that intro that synopsis that Bria gave us earlier uh, that she got online was almost essentially what the what the what the trailer gives us we get um, some of the most comedic moments and then we almost we also get some very sweet moments in there as well I don't remember seeing the trailer i'm sure i did i'm sure it played on tv i'm sure it aired before other movies that i saw during this time but i don't remember the trailer as much as like the anaconda trailers that were really big it's the tv like kind of commercial spot like promoting i'm not sure if maybe by now it's like the dvd or something but promoting the movie and love don't cost a thing is the music in the tv spot so that's why i was like did you did you see this tv spot because it's amazing um the trailer gives away so much like even mm-hmm. the dumpster like meet cute and all that stuff and i will say it didn't deter like i don't feel like i would be deterred because on a romantic level like you're like oh like oh. I want to see that. Like, mm-hmm. you don't care that you know most of, like, what happens. You're just like, oh, my God. I Yes, give me all the feels. Like, mm-hmm. sign me up. Mm-hmm. I'm ready for some tears in my popcorn and a little extra salt never hurt. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, unlike other movies, I don't feel like it is a detriment to the trailer, I think. For rom-coms, it works well to give, like, a good part yeah. of the story in the plot because we're still going to be suckers who want to see like what happens <laughs> like, right and I think I think you know what you're getting yourself into when you see a rom-com um yeah. versus like blood and wine out of sight like when we have these more action, yeah <laughs> we have these more like action-packed movies we want that bit of mystery in there but with rom-com there's not a lot of mystery like you know the boy and the girl are gonna end up together probably at least yeah, in this it's time it's formulaic so it's you're right yeah totally i don't totally. care i just i just want to be along for the ride and live yeah. vicariously through these people these really really good looking actors yes who, who are falling fake in love <laughs> and i know when when you and i watched this as soon as the ending credits came on with my love don't cost a thing comes on we both were like <gasps> like we both got very excited and then when i was reading reviews about this it wasn't so much about it wasn't so much legitimate movie review like credible movie reviewers it was more just like people's basic opinions like you and i but some people like really shit on this movie because they felt like it was a uh, just an excuse to promote the J Lo album, which I don't. Th- I mean, you put one song in there, okay, but movie snack mm-hmm. and cocktail. Mm-hmm. We kind of talked about this while we watched. So, uh, but do you share with our two people <laughs> audience? <laughs> With my mom and the other person that's listening to this, um, no, I'm just kidding. Um, yeah, our movie cocktail or our snack for sure would be M and M's, um, but only the brown ones because supposedly, you know, since chocolate is already brown, there's less artificial coloring in it. Which I read something that kind of disproved his theory that yes. had said like, well, actually, lighter colored chocolate. Because it, when you have an M and M, like a peanut M and M or a regular M and M, it's 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 candy coated, it's sugar coated, it's not coated by another layer of chocolate. And lighter colors like orange and yellow and red 
maybe not so much red, but like orange, yellow, and green take less artificial coloring for those lighter ones than a darker color like a red or a brown. So shame on you, Steve. You should have known that <laughs> as a pediatrician. Yeah, doctor. <laughs> okay. Um, but yeah, peanut M&Ms for sure. Probably just the brown ones for the sake of going through the motif of this movie. Um, and then for my cocktail, I'm going with something classic that you get at a wedding, like champagne. Oh, that, oh, that's a good point. And then for my snack, uh, we were thoroughly impressed with, as Simone noted in her intro with Massimo's craft mac and cheese. Uh-huh. So we were, we were making that for snack, dinner, whatever for this movie. And I agree with your, your movie cocktail. I think something classy and simple like champagne or maybe i'll say prosecco um, bring it bring it a little up to speed a little sparkling rosé perhaps you know pretty wedding color mm-hmm. um would be would be my cocktail and and then we could make really bad like bridesmaids fake bridesmaids test <laughs> <laughs> <All night. laughs> um how many pumps of butter are we giving the wedding planner? I would give this a solid, I would give this a solid three and a half pumps of butter. I wouldn't go for a jumbo bucket of popcorn for this one. I'd go with a, a modest medium for this, even though I would definitely still finish the bag with a medium. Even though it's not my favorite rom-com, if I have a favorite rom-com, it's actually How to Lose a Guy in 10 Days. But I still think that there's some of this that can hold up to today. It still made me laugh and maybe giggle. I had a good time watching it with you. Um, And so for this, I would get a solid medium popcorn with three, three and a half pumps of butter. Yeah. I mean, I, I really like How to Lose a Guy in 10 Days, too, and especially watching it so closely after uh, The Wedding Planner. I was mm-hmm. like, oh, this just did everything right. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, this movie's super nostalgic to me, so part of me wants to give it, like, four pumps of butter and a half, just a little extra squirt for nostalgia. Just a little... uh-huh. <laughs> yeah, just a little extra tap on the pump, just to be <laughs> sure. <laughs> Um, for nostalgia and just like feel goodery and epicness of this time period for Jennifer Lopez. Mm -hmm. I also just want to know before we leave this movie kind of in her conversation with Matthew McConaughey, she mentioned that this movie kind of has a bit of like some awesome his like historical record thing and that she's in the Guinness book of world records because she's the only actress to have the number one movie and a number one album that is not a soundtrack for the movie. Because I was like, really? Like, Cher, Bette Midler, Barbara Streisand, Whitney Houston, really? But um, I noted, and we'll I, we will talk about this more in the mini episode for sure. But I noted that J Lo really hadn't done music simultaneously for her movies, and yes, Love Don't Cost a Thing is shoehorned in the credits and in a TV spot. But that is impressive because despite her making a movie, she was also able to successfully make an album that was able to achieve like simultaneously number one success. So. Yeah, that's a really good fun fact. I had no, I did not know that at all. So that's awesome. Yes. So with that, I will leave. Um, <laughs> all right. Well, Bria, do you want to send us out here? Yes. All right, everybody. Thank you so much for listening to this week's episode. And to the people who stuck with us so far, please, please don't give up on us. Please stick with us for another episode of the great value version of Inside the Actor's Studio. But seriously, y'all, if you like us enough to stick around, take another deep dive down this IMDB rabbit hole with us as we discuss our next movie to discuss will be Angel Eyes. But stay tuned for a special mini episode as uh, Bria and I discuss the general pop culture, music career, and personal life of Jennifer Lopez. And on that note, if you've got nothing better to do, go figure out a theme to watch a bunch of movies you've never seen. (laughs) I'm your host, Simone. 
And I'm your host, Bria. And this has been another episode of Roll Call. Roll Call. <laughs> and cut. That line always makes me laugh so hard. I wonder <laughs> by the end of this if we become polished enough that we can become like the regular like store brand <laughs> version. <laughs>